Hi guys, how are you getting on? It is Sean Ferrick here for Who Culture, and I am here to discuss with you episode three of Doctor Who Flux. We're gonna go through the ups and downs. Now, you know how this works. We're gonna go through the episode and give everything that we liked an up, and everything that we didn't like a down. Without much further ado, let's get going with Once Upon Time. Now, the first up that I have for this episode is the framing device, which is Belle's story and her journey to find this person who we don't know who it is at the start of the episode that she's trying to find. Now, we see straight away there's Daleks flowing around. Woohoo! There's the flux has torn through the planet. We'll get back to that one. And over the course of the episode, we see Cybermen as well. You know, having Daleks and Cybermen in the same episode always good fun even if they don't have any scenes together now they also name drop the Santarans as well it's a strong strong opening and it was really compelling for me to find out okay who is Belle where is she going and what is this bit of the story about now almost skipping to the end of it like once we discover who Belle is I liked that I actually liked that reveal I like that it's Vinder she's trying to find now all of Belle's storyline in this episode, for me, is an up. I really like the way it's done, I really like the way it's acted, and I really like the way it's shot. Some of the other element of the story, for example, some of Vinder's story, didn't really do it that much for me, and there was a tiny little bit of an obvious reveal that, you know, she was talking to her baby the whole time. I don't think it merits a down, but I was just like, Okay, kind of saw that coming, but what I didn't see coming, and I quite liked, was the switch that it was Vinder. So overall, for me, the framing device is an absolute up this week. Now, the episode being called Once Upon Time is, of course, a clue to the Doctor's part of this story. Now, the Doctor has managed to save Yaz, Vinder, and Dan by hiding them in their own time streams throughout this episode. However, she also has hidden herself in her own time stream. And this is, of course, to save them from Swarm and Azure, who are the Ravagers, who are basically not very nice people. For Yaz, we get to see a little bit of a hint at what's coming in the future, because her storyline has been invaded by Weeping Angels. Now, the Weeping Angels, for me, used in this episode, up from me. It brings back some of that good old-fashioned terror that the Weeping Angels used to inspire. Now I say used to because they ran the risk of being a little bit overused during some of Stephen Moffat's era, but because it's been so long since we've seen them and we know exactly what they can do and how scary they can be, it was really nice to see it. And also I really like that their storyline combined a couple of different throwbacks as well. One of course is the throwback to Flesh and Stone and the Time of the Angels, which is an image of an angel becomes an angel itself. So Yaz sees the weeping angels, first of all, in the car mirror, and then in the rear view mirror. And then she sees it on the video game. So in each of these times, the angel is getting closer and closer to becoming corporeal. Yaz, of course, hasn't got a clue what's going on, and she is absolutely freaked out. And thankfully, the doctor is able to intervene in two of those events and save her from getting sent somewhere off into the far past. However, the second reference, callback if you like, that includes the Weeping Angels this week, is the fact that Yaz's phone contains an image of an angel, it is released, and the angel gets inside the control room of the TARDIS. The Doctor, shielding Dan and Yaz, puts her arms out and says, the angel has the TARDIS. It's a rewording of the coolest t-shirt of all time, which is, the angels have the phone box which of course goes all the way back to their first appearance in Blink. That is an up from me. For the first time this season, Dan was a little bit too naive in one of the scenes. Now, right at, toward the very end, and the reveal, of course, something we kind of saw coming, that Diane has been captured by Swarm and Azure, you know, Dan's like, we'll stop you, yeah, tally-ho, everything's fine. And it just came across a little bit like, Dan, have you not seen enough at this point now to maybe not fools rush in? So that was actually a down for me this week. Yes, I'm downing Dan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But the rest of Dan's story, I did quite like. I love how John Bishop plays that sort of 
you know, fish out of water, man out of time version of this person. He has that chat with Dai and it's all very, very sad. And he has a chat with the guy, I just gotta keep calling him Tunnel Dude. I know, I know he has a name, but isn't Tunnel Dude a cooler title? Has a chat with him and Tunnel Dude is able to protect him from the elements of what we discover is the time vortex trying to clean everything up so he saves his life and there is a, a nice kind of blind leading the blind in that scene a little bit overall strangely enough, dan didn't really get an awful lot to do this week what he did do apart from reveal a little bit of naivety there at the end it did work for me except that i have one big question and it relates to dan but it's not actually dan himself so if we go into the doctor's time stream now we see that in a time in the past the doctor led a group against the ravagers on time this planet this time haze as they keep saying is affecting her mind so that she doesn't realize that she's not actually jodie whittaker's doctor because she catches herself in the mirror and it's joe martin up up it's ruth this is footage if you like from the doctor's days before William Hartnell. Now this is big because the doctor almost loses all, you know, control because she needs to know, she needs to know what was going on. And she gets in this moment irrevocable proof that Swarm and Azure knew her before she became William Hartnell. Now her companions, of course, are played by Yaz, Vinder and Dan, but they are not Yaz, Vinder and Dan because Dan morphs slightly into Carvanista. Now it could just be any Lupari perhaps played by the same actor in the same way that Dan Starkey has played about a million Sontarans. I don't know, something about this seems a bit too familiar, you know, when we see Carvanista arrive. And for me, that was a down because it added too much of a question to this scene. It took me out of the mystery. No problem at all with there being mystery. Great to see Ruth again, you know, great to see that. We want to know what's happening. But that was like, well, well, hang on, are the Lupari incredibly long lived? You know, has he been around forever and ever and ever? Older, in fact, than the Doctor themselves, or at least our understanding of the Doctor themselves. What is going on here? It was enough to be like, hang on, that's a wee bit of a curveball because a bit like my issue from a couple of weeks ago, where the hell have the Lupari been all this time? Where the hell have the Lupari been all this time? So I didn't actually like the inclusion of, I'm gonna say Carvanista, we, we, might, we might discover it's not Carvanista himself, but didn't like that addition in this framing backstory. Now, one thing I did like in that framing backstory was how the Doctor manages to outsmart Swarm and Azure and sneak the Mori into the Temple of Apropos. I really enjoyed that. I liked seeing her victor over Swarm and Azure. I like how she was like, of course you've made thrones for yourselves. The fact that she was able to smuggle Mori in, in passenger, meant that she has to have assumed there was going to be casualties. But it's alluded to the fact two of those passengers who were destroyed by Swarm and Azure contained hundreds of thousands, if not millions of life forms, making this a dreadful massacre. Should there not have been slightly more of a reaction to this? I'm gonna down that. I'm actually going to down that because I think that was played too bizarre. It was too kind of, oh, well, it's fine. But what I will do is I will up the doctor's resolution to this problem back in the day. Now there was, of course, the, the slightly incongruous continue the shelling on the temple. We're gonna force them into submission. That is, but well, it's certainly not the 10th Doctor, for example, you know, I never would. Uh, whereas the 11th Doctor fired a gun about three seconds into being the Doctor. So there's a there's precedent there for, you know, one likes weapons, one doesn't. I think there is a Machiavellian way of Ruth's plan here is just basically shell them into submission. It's not enough for me to up the plan of attack. I do up the resolution, but I do down that there was a certain collateral damage taken into account. So. Bit of, a, bit of a mixed bag, really. But how good was it to see Ruth again? What we get as well is we get pretty much all we need to know about Vinder in this episode. Jacob Anderson plays a blinder. In fact, up for Vinder this week. All through his story, we find out that he is incredibly honorable. He has been given an extremely, extremely prestigious role in his own military on his planet, where he is guarding basically the head, 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 head guy. Shockingly, the head, 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 head guy 
is not really a great guy, whereas Vinder is. So when the head, head, head guy does something pretty damn bad and Vinder reports him, he finds himself stuck out in a posting way off in the middle of space, which is where we found him in the start of the first episode of the season. I buy it. I buy it. I... I understand that the Vinder we've seen so far, yes, is this exact kind of character who would do the right thing, who would fight for, you know, justice and retribution. I do have to ask myself, if somebody had got to this level of protection, would they not have had an idea of what they were getting themselves into in terms of if the Grand Serpent was so bad as to effectively order the assassination of this family. Would there not have been some sort of clue? Maybe there wouldn't have been. I'll be fair. So rather than downing that, it was enough for me to go, I'm just not sure. However, overall, as I say, Jacob Anderson this week is an up from me, Vinder's an up from me, and of course, that reveal at the end. There's a mystery dropped into the episode when the Doctor appears in a location that is not part of anybody's time stream, and it turns out, in fact, to be what seems to be the originator of all of the Flux. Now this character explains to the Doctor that effectively time and space are kind of at war. It's a bit like matter and antimatter, that if they touch they annihilate each other. And it's worded slightly differently, but that's sort of the impression you get here. And that this battle for supremacy, when the scales are tipped, can cause an apocalyptic event, such as the flux we saw in episode one, this destruction. It's very clear to say that that was a spatial, spatial effect. So time is going to have its own war. So we'll enjoy that as it goes. This character is laughing at the Doctor going, the universe is over, Doctor. You've already lost the fight. The damage is done. And of course, this is Doctor Who. We don't accept this lying down. I really like just how callous and matter of fact this character was. This is an up from me. I thought it was so, give it up doctor. Like there's really nothing you can do. You know, well done, well done, go home, it's all done. I like that because as ever in Doctor Who, we always love when there's another bigger bad to have to deal with. This conversation carries over into the seeming saving of the day by the Doctor towards the end of the episode. And she has the conversation with Swarm and Azure. This is where we discover that Diane has been trapped inside Passenger. But also, the Doctor is able to convince the Mori to set up this guardianship again. That's fine, they can keep time and place. Everything's great. The flux has still happened. The TARDIS is still sick because the door is still appearing everywhere. Swarm tells the Doctor that they counted on this entirely. They knew that this was coming and the Doctor asks them, what is it you want? And Swarm says, to reign in hell, which gets an automatic up from me because we love a literary reference in Doctor Who whenever we can. That's pretty much it. Now, a couple of really quick ups and downs for me. First of all, Belle fighting the Cybermen. Up, somebody dumped Dan just before a wedding day. Down, how dare you? That's everything for our episode this week, guys. Let us know what you thought. You can let us know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, you can catch us over on Twitter at Who Culture. You can catch myself at Sean Ferrick on all of the socials as well. Until I see you next week, you keep things wibbly wobbly, you look after yourself, and whatever you do, don't blink.